As another decade has passed us, it is important to decide on whether to resume past policies, continue current ones, or to redirect our resources and shift our priorities for the next decade. As was alluded to in the previous episode about the Canadian intelligence community's future priorities, many have been calling for the intelligence community to shift its focus and resources towards countering right-wing terrorism. In the U.S. context, contrary to the Canadian context, these voices are correct. This episode will argue that U.S. intelligence counterterrorism resources and priorities should be shifted from Islamic terrorism towards right-wing terrorism. I would also briefly mention how more resources should be given to countering left-wing terrorism, which includes ecological terrorism, and to counterintelligence and counterproliferation efforts. I will end by proposing methods that may be used to respond to and prevent these growing and enduring threats. This episode may act as a policy brief for the United States government regarding federal intelligence priorities and strategies. Similar to our previous episode, we must define our terms in order to level the playing field. First, what is intelligence? The CIA provides us with a thorough definition, saying that it refers to, quote, the collecting and processing of that information about foreign countries and their agents, which is needed by our government for its foreign policy and for national security, end quote. While other agencies and experts, through the passing of time, may offer different definitions. The fundamental idea behind intelligence remains as presented within the CIA's definition. Well then, what is terrorism? It is understood to be indiscriminate violence against civilians or non-combatants in the pursuit of a political, ideological, religious, or social goal. In the case of Islamic State, for example, it would be violence against civilians for religious and political reasons as their stated goal is to establish an Islamic caliphate and to eradicate demographic groups such as Shia Muslims, Christians, and Yazidis. It is usually committed by a non-state group or actor, although states can fund, organize, or carry out terrorism and threaten world peace. States that do so may generally be referred to as, quote, rogue or outlaw states. These definitions are important to know to comprehend the topic at hand. In terms of the intelligence community, we are looking at both civilian and military intelligence agencies in the United States, including the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and 13 other members of the U.S. intelligence community. Prior to 9-11, terrorism as a priority was not commonplace within intelligence agencies, Actually, as Phil Gursky talks about in recent interviews with Vosh and David Pakman, terrorism was a very obscure subject reserved for academics and fringe analysts. Most of the intelligence practice from the end of World War II onwards, and arguably prior to that, was focused on state power, namely state counterintelligence, counterespionage, and regime promotion special operations abroad. This, most experts agree, lasted until about the end of the Cold War. As has become cliché at this point, 9-11 changed this dynamic and everything relating to national security. A paradigm shift in intelligence agencies towards countering non-state terrorism was already underway in the late 1980s and 1990s as a result of Islamic terrorist attacks perpetrated by Al-Qaeda on U.S. Embassy abroad and the World Trade Center attack in 1993 as well as attacks by the Taliban and Lakshar e Taiba. This shift was, still, rapidly exacerbated by the 9-11 attacks. In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, most, if not all, resources within law enforcement and intelligence agencies were redirected towards counterterrorism, specifically countering Islamic terrorism. Currently, the price tag for the operation that followed, being the U.S.-led war on terror, a term which I and others hate, stands at around 6.4 trillion US dollars. This includes the costs of the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, the campaigns in other Middle Eastern and African countries, as well as the counterterrorism efforts at home. This still does not include the budgets allocated to surveillance operations related to counter Islamic terrorism within intelligence agencies, 
which is estimated to be a few hundred billion US dollars as well. As the United States continues these missions and priorities, even under the supposed isolationist Trump administration, and as the Biden administration would be likely to continue these missions and operations, these costs are certain to continue going up. Although the methods used by US intelligence agencies in the aftermath of 9-11 have been more than questionable in terms of morality, logistics, and success, 9-11 still remains to this day the deadliest non-state terrorist attack in history. In fact, no attack has even come close to it. The deadliest Islamic terrorist attacks on US soil after 9-11 have been the 2016 Orlando nightclub shooting, the 2015 San Bernardino attack, and the 2017 New York City truck attack, which resulted in 50, 16, and 8 deaths, respectively. The trend overall in deaths from Islamic terrorism in the United States points downward. Many experts have claimed that the post-9-11 era is over. That is not to say, however, that resources should not be progressively shifted away from fighting Islamic terrorism in the United States and towards countering other threats. In fact, I will argue that in terms of counterterrorism efforts, funds, personnel, and resources, such elements should be focused on right-wing terrorism for the upcoming decade. This is primarily due to the higher number of actual and potential deaths from right-wing terrorism and other threats within the United States. Since the Bill Clinton administration, which started in 1992, one year after the timeline of the Turner Diaries, a hateful novel deemed as, quote, the Bible of the racist right by the FBI, right-wing terror attacks have become quite commonplace in the United States. The 1995 Oklahoma City bombing by white supremacist and anti-government terrorist Timothy McVeigh, who was inspired by the Turner Diaries and radicalized by government failures at Ruby Ridge and Waco, is often deemed the starting point of a new kind of right-wing terrorism in the United States. Prior to such an attack, Right-wing terrorist attacks committed in the United States were primarily targeted against ethnic minorities, mostly black Americans, being classified as white supremacist or neo-Nazi violence, or not even registering as terrorism due to the lack of rights possessed by black Americans at the time. Since then, however, the term right-wing terrorism has broadened to include anti-government, anti-immigration, anti-left-wing, anti-Semitic, and anti-Islamic terrorist attacks, as well as anti-black violence. As we will see later on, the COVID-19 pandemic, which, as of the time of this recording, is still ravaging through the country at a rapid rate, has provided favorable conditions to the further rise of right-wing terrorism within the United States. The Trump presidency has also been a contributing factor to right-wing terrorism being considered by myself and many others to be the foremost priority of the counterterrorism effort to be exercised by law enforcement and intelligence agencies within the United States government in the upcoming decade. One fact that is hard for some to grapple with is that the number of actual and potential deaths in the United States from right-wing terrorism for the past 10 years is higher than that of Islamic terrorism. By the numbers alone, it is clear that right-wing terrorism has been the most prominent form of terrorism in the United States in recent years, while Islamic terrorism has been on the decline. According to a recent report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, right-wing extremists perpetrated two-thirds of the attacks and plots in the United States in 2019, and over 90% of them in 2020. The report also points out that right-wing terrorism attacks have made up the majority of terrorist plots and attacks in the United States every year since 1994, confirming my points made prior. Overall, between 1994 and 2020, there were 893 terrorist attacks and plots in the United States. Right-wing terrorists perpetrated the majority, 57%, of all attacks and plots during this time. 335 people have died as a direct result of these right-wing terror attacks. If we subtract the deaths from the 9-11 attacks for the purpose of the study, Only 109 individuals have died as a result of religious terrorist attacks. Moreover, while there are no reported Islamic terrorist cells and groups active in the United States, hundreds of right-wing terrorist groups are currently active in the United States. These include the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys, Patriot Prayer, the Boogaloo Boys, and the Michigan Militia, 
recently brought into the spotlight due to their attempted kidnapping of Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Finally, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center's very thorough intelligence reports and hate watch reports, there has been a 55% increase in the number of white nationalist groups since 2017, a change which is definitely not insignificant. Given the current fragile and unstable state of United States politics at this moment, it is also a given that there will be a continued reactionary increase in right-wing terrorist groups and incidents under the Trump administration, whether Donald Trump gets re-elected for a second term, seizes power through force and contestation, or loses the election. Experts are currently expecting a spike in such right-wing violence, regardless of the election's outcome. Whether or not Donald Trump goes away, the people that go to extreme lengths to support him and prop him up are here to stay. These people are armed to the teeth, motivated as ever, and are only looking for a reason to strike. Many have even taken up going to protest-prone cities such as Portland, Minneapolis, and Kenosha to fight left-wing protesters. Vigilante justice and retribution has become commonplace in such cities, where right-wing extremist groups and individuals carry out their premeditated plan and desire to harm or even kill protesters. Unfortunately, President Trump, his cabinet, as well as the loyal right-wing media have been quick to rationalize and justify these attacks, including the one in which Kyle Rittenhouse, a 17-year-old Trump supporter who traveled across state lines with firearms to, quote, protect Kenosha against Black Lives Matter protesters and looters, allegedly killed two individuals and seriously injured another. With all of this in mind, it is therefore clear that on numbers and data alone, Right-wing terrorism needs to be taken seriously and made a priority in counterterrorism efforts. I will address counterterrorism policy solutions in the last segment. Now, while right-wing terrorism should be made a top priority, it is clear that, as the saying goes, we should not put all of our eggs in one basket. Many threats continue to be relevant and will remain enduring threats in the upcoming decade. Islamic terrorism, while on the decrease in the United States, remains a looming threat to be sure. Recent attacks in San Bernardino, New York City, and Orlando in the past five years, while nowhere near a repeat of the 9-11 attacks, still show that the threat needs to be taken seriously. International Islamic terrorism, particularly Salafist and Wahhabist terrorism, funded, armed, and orchestrated by Saudi Arabia, continues to be of particular concern. While Iran is touted as the number one state sponsor of Islamic-motivated terror in the world, experts and data point to that role being attributed to Saudi Arabia and other countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, rather than Iran. Iran is still to be paid attention to, to be sure, particularly its nuclear program and its cyber warfare capabilities, as the Trump administration broke and revoked the Iran nuclear deal not too long ago. Islamic terrorism as a whole and Salafi Wahhabist terrorism in particular, needs to continue to be monitored carefully by American intelligence agencies. Left-wing terrorism, including ecological terrorism, is also becoming a larger threat. I would still say that this threat will not supersede those posed by right-wing and Islamic terrorism, at least not until the next decade or so. Nonetheless, left-wing terrorism, also broadly characterized as anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, or anti-fascist terrorism, has been fairly minor. Antifa seems to be the primary perpetrator of left-wing violence in the United States at the moment, although the discourse around Antifa is quite inaccurate and even toxic. Antifa itself is certainly not structured or organized quite like the Proud Boys, the Timil Tigers, or even Black September. Rather, there are many groups and individuals which act on their own motives and beliefs with little superstructure or leadership. There is still no identifiable leader of Antifa, either internationally, nationally, or even locally. What the chapters of Antifa do in Portland or Richmond is completely up to the individual chapters and members to decide. Categorizing them as a terrorist group alongside big groups like Islamic State or the KKK would therefore be counterproductive and inaccurate. Members of Antifa have committed acts of violence and property damage, and thus need to be monitored. 
This should be done on a case-by-case -case basis with people showing red flags, and certain left-wing groups, including Antifa, should still be tracked as violence is their preferred protesting strategy. A bottom-up approach, rather than a top-down one, would be preferred when dealing with Antifa and other left-wing groups. Moreover, Antifa should not be tracked as a whole, but on a selective and rigorous basis to distinguish between non-violent and peaceful political protests and acts of terrorism and ideological violence. I would go out on a limb and say that ecological terrorism will be a much more significant problem than so-called left-wing terrorism. This is due to the fact that the threat posed by man-made climate change has been getting closer and closer to the point of irreversibility. The most recent United Nations report on climate gives us 12 years to make drastic and fundamental changes to our resource and energy systems before the effects of climate change become irreversible. In these upcoming 12 years and after that deadline is passed, if or when our governments do not make the required changes, ecological terrorist attacks will certainly increase. These attacks will also increase after the deadline is reached, especially if the adequate governmental measures have not been taken. While ecological terror attacks have focused on property damage, with the deadliest eco-terrorist being the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, their attacks may get deadlier in the near future. Tactics have shifted from property damage, which is still sustained at a statistically significant level, to also include mob violence, riots, and quote-unquote direct action. There is also a great threat of right-wing terrorism mixing with ecological terrorism. This was recently showcased in Central and Eastern Europe with neo-Nazi movements adopting ecologically conscious rhetoric, and by the Christchurch mosque shooter in New Zealand, who is described as both an eco-fascist and a white supremacist terrorist. The right wing has seemingly hijacked ecologically conscious ideology and rhetoric as a way to justify their own racist and anti-globalization views, pointing to climate cause mass exodus as a call for altered migration and an ethnostate, for instance. Thusly, all these terrorist threats primarily right-wing terrorism, need to be prioritized by United States intelligence agencies in the 2020s. Other threats which people view as less interesting are still important to pay attention to. Particularly, counterintelligence and counterproliferation are still to be maintained within the United States intelligence agencies. State threats continue to pose a great threat to U.S. national security, with main perpetrators being China, Russia, Cuba, Saudi Arabia, India, Pakistan, and Iran. Each one of these countries has repeatedly shown the United States in the past decade that it is both willing and able to damage its governmental institutions, steal government secrets, undermine U.S. foreign policy and military missions abroad, and threaten world peace through its increased militarization as well as the active pursuit of chemical, biological, radiological, and even nuclear weapons. Some, like Russia, India, and Pakistan, already have an incredible arsenal of such weapons, while others, including China, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, are looking to build more. To start, counterintelligence refers to the practice of intelligence in order to prevent or detect foreign spies or any sabotage of one's governmental or societal activities through election meddling or disinformation campaigns, for example, from a foreign intelligence service. It is meant to protect your country's secrets, information, and institutions from foreign interference. Although this is rarely the case, counterintelligence can sometimes be deadly, as foreign agents may pursue assassination programs in one's country and thus need to be neutralized rather than arrested or compromised. This kind of activity has also started to be carried out by non-state actors with higher frequency than ever before, especially relating to informational leaks and cybersecurity breaches. Foreign or intelligence service agents' identity and activity may be leaked and government databases may be compromised, putting our intelligence agencies and their agents at risk of exposure. There are thus two main types of activity that counterintelligence attempts to prevent, human and cyber activity. Although human counterintelligence is still most prevalent through the form of counterespionage, cyber counterintelligence is a growing threat that needs to be considered carefully by our intelligence services. It is thus established that one's intelligence services, information, secrets, and institutions can be infiltrated or penetrated through human and cyber means, as well as other less significant means. These include signals counterintelligence and imagery counterintelligence, for example, 
which still need to be paid attention to. America's counterintelligence threats are highly similar to those of the other Five Eyes partners, as these countries often share intelligence missions, strategies, priorities, and techniques. In his last book, To Catch a Spy, The Art of Counterintelligence, former CIA Chief of Counterintelligence James Olson explains that the biggest counterintelligence threats are China, Russia, and Cuba. This is because they are, quote, recruiting spies in our midst and stealing our secrets and cutting-edge technologies. They constitute massive threats in terms of, quote, espionage, cyber, and covert action assault, end quote. Olson states that although all three countries' intelligence agencies are engaged in many dangerous counterintelligence activities, China is most infamous for stealing secrets and infiltrating government agencies, Russia for disinformation and espionage through double and triple agents, and Cuba for its aggressive and fearless approach in recruiting spies and outing and disciplining foreign agents. According to Olson, Cuba also often relays stolen information and assets to Beijing and Moscow, as he also alluded to in his book, although he does not add this country to the list. The Mossad, Shin Bet, and the Israeli intelligence services in general constitute a counterintelligence challenge, although not necessarily a major threat to the likes of Cuba, China, or Russia. Olson gives the example of Jonathan Pollard, who was a U.S. intelligence analyst, found guilty of providing top-secret classified secrets to Israel, to prove his point. Pollard was then sentenced to life in prison. There are other examples of Israeli double agents infiltrating Five Eyes intelligence agencies, although Pollard is the most prominent. Moreover, according to Israeli intelligence expert and journalist for Haaretz, Yossi Melman, Israel is also a counterintelligence threat as it is stealing Five Eyes secrets. In fact, he states that, quote, Russia and China have in recent years enhanced their espionage efforts in Israel, particularly to obtain access to both state-owned and private sector Israeli tech companies and through them to the United States, a close ally of Israel, end quote. Secrets about American companies, particularly American defense companies, are also being relayed to China through intellectual property stolen from Israel. Non-state actors are also highly dangerous in this regard, as financial and personal reward often lead intelligence employees to betray their country. To state simply one recent example, last month, an NYPD police officer was arrested for allegedly spying for China. There are dozens of stories of Chinese double agents just in the recent past, and these stories also apply to Cuba, Israel, Russia, Saudi, and other countries. This tactic of luring agents for financial or personal rewards is also used by state actors. Non-state actors have also targeted American public institutions, orchestrating information leaks, trying to hack into public systems, or sowing disinformation or discord in the American public and government. Although Russian influence was at its peak in the former USSR era, China seems to have replaced Russia in this role, corrupting American academia and media through big money financing. Stories in recent years have surfaced, which detail how the Chinese Communist Party has planted Chinese spies and university student associations, monitored Chinese and American students' behavior on university campuses, and funded academic research favorable to the Chinese Communist Party. It has also inserted itself in media discourse, funding YouTubers and journalists to do their bidding in American public discourse. Recent telecommunications and social concerns over Chinese companies like Huawei, TikTok, and WeChat are also worth mentioning. These are threats that need to be taken seriously and need to be remedied quickly in order for the United States to maintain its place as a reliable and foolproof ally of the Five Eyes community and other intelligence partners. As suggested by Olson and others, this may be remedied by first putting more rigor into the civilian and military intelligence hiring process doubling down on financial and personal red flags and character flaws. An internal inquiry into the IC's hiring process would thus be in order, followed by possibly more funding to CI units across the federal service, counter and prevent growing and persistent CI threats. In terms of cyber CI threats, the NSA in particular, as well as the CIA, DIA, United States military, and FBI, should also continue vigorously hiring cybersecurity and information technology experts and technologists through universities and technical colleges, 
as well as promoting through social media and media platforms, as has been done in the past five years. The United States intelligence community's information is at risk, and only the country's best and brightest may help safeguard it and protect the United States against the growing threats outlined prior. Finally, a more active and offensive rather than passive CI strategy must be put in place, as we must prevent CI offenses rather than react to them. This will require higher coordination with CI allies within Five Eyes, and for the United States to reconsider partnerships and deals with CI enemies, most notably China and Russia. Counterintelligence must continue to be a priority for U.S. intelligence. It should be given more attention and resources whenever possible. Counterproliferation is the last intelligence priority which we will address in today's episode. Although it is arguably less common of a threat than counterintelligence or counterterrorism, the consequences of a failure to deal with the threat of WMD proliferation have the potential to be much deadlier than either of these two priorities, as a bad counterproliferation strategy may lead to thousands or even millions of deaths. To begin, what exactly is counterproliferation? Well, it refers to the curtailment of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction whether nuclear, biological, chemical, or radiological in nature, in the hands of state and non-state actors and groups. These non-state actors and groups include terrorist groups, as many terrorist groups, such as Islamic State, have tried to acquire weapons of mass destruction. In fact, in a 2019 interview with the Daily Beast, a chemical weapons expert for ISIS revealed that Islamic State has been working towards obtaining biological and chemical weapons including mustard gas and chlorine gas, which it used in an attack against the Kurdish Peshmerga. It is also developing drones capable of dispersing chemical and biological weapons. Al-Qaeda has also been working on nuclear, biological, radiological, and chemical weapons since the 1990s, and they have tried multiple times to use them, including in 93. Most WMD proliferation, however, occurs at the hands of states. States to watch out for currently include non-nuclear states North Korea, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Iran, and nuclear states of Israel, India, Pakistan, Russia, and China. These are mostly states with WMD which have either used them in the past or threatened to use them, or are actively looking to acquire them for purposes of deterrence or aggression. Technology is rapidly advancing in areas such as encryption and cryptocurrency, which can be used to hide illicit activities from authorities. As well, many goods and technologies, including everyday items, have the potential to be used or modified to produce weapons and military items, including WMD. To fight the threat of proliferation, the US government has engaged in and signed on to many counterproliferation treaties and partnerships, most of them legally binding. These include signing on to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Biological and Toxins Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Hague Code of Conduct Against Ballistic Missile Proliferation, and the Australia Group, tasked with preventing the cross-border export of WMD and WMD materials. My recommendation is that the U.S. continue to be an integral and active part of and signatory to these partnerships and treaties, regardless of which government is in power. Another recommendation would be to increase communication between partners, including the NSA, CIA, FBI, and DIA, ensuring that information sharing is encouraged and maximized. Information sharing, dialogue, and negotiation should also be done more extensively with external partners, mostly foreign governments, in counterproliferation matters, and to participate in as many multilateral conventions and negotiations on these matters as possible, sending task experts and officials from these agencies to report on counterproliferation matters. Other agencies and departments may be included when relevant, such as the Department of Energy, the State Department, and DOD. Frequent meetings with the IAEA to receive updates would also be relevant. These items laid prior may be a good starting point. Now, to return to counterterrorism for a moment, I would like to provide the United States government with some objectives, methods, strategies, and policies that may help in its reprioritization of its counterterrorism efforts at home and abroad. First, I will outline approaches that I believe do not produce adequate results. This starts with the Enhanced Interrogation Program, 
also called the torture program. These techniques, now technically made inapplicable by Executive Order 13491, signed by President Obama, were not only unconstitutional and illegal under international law, but most importantly, ineffective. The overwhelming majority of intelligence and interrogation experts, including many at the CIA and FBI, conclude that enhanced interrogation techniques do not produce unique nor reliable intelligence. These techniques, conducted on CIA clandestine locations, also referred to as black sites, have included mock burials, sleep deprivation, dehydration and malnourishment, the use of insects, learned helplessness, and, most infamously, waterboarding. The only case in which the program's apologists and defenders were claiming its success were for the interrogation of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, allegedly leading to the killing of Osama bin Laden in 2011, although there is no evidence pointing to the link. Rather, the intelligence produced by KSM only misled the intelligence community, alleging that Al-Qaeda was recruiting black Muslim converts in Montana. Due to the unconstitutional, illegal, cruel, and ineffective nature of these techniques, my recommendation would be to never make use of them again. If my recommendation was not followed, horrible consequences would ensue, including a complete loss of credibility on the part of the US government, as well as potential use of these techniques by other countries against US prisoners. These techniques would therefore endanger American freedom and security. Another approach, which continues to this day, is bulk metadata and or content collection. Since the George W. Bush administration, the Patriot Act and other bills have allowed the U.S. intelligence communities to collect bulk metadata and or content from individuals that consider to be at risk or worthy of prioritization. This has shifted policy and practice away from targeted surveillance of individuals and groups of high value and priority towards warrantless mass surveillance of millions of individuals, many of whom pose no risk to U.S. national security. This is, in my view, an incredible misallocation of resources, time, energy, funds, and personnel. I would therefore recommend that the policy be shifted back to pre-Patriot Act policy, focusing on high-value targets and groups. The FBI, in particular, has been effective in maintaining a human intelligence surveillance policy based on warrants and data-backed high-value targets and groups. While signals intelligence could be incorporated into its intelligence collection practices, it should still be limited to specific individuals and groups, rather than millions of individuals. I would also discuss the drone program, also referred to as the UAV or Unmanned Aerial Warfare program, but I will reserve that for a future episode due to the sheer complexity and scope of the program and its implications. Now, I will discuss strategies that do work and can work. As was just mentioned, targeted surveillance would be my preferred method of surveillance over bulk collection. This applies to signals and human intelligence, both online and offline. Based on risk analysis, specific individuals and groups should be tracked and monitored within targeted internet forums, radicalization channels, detention facilities, social media platforms, and YouTube. A more rigorous process for distributing security clearances to federal government and military service members should also be put into place, as detailed by Professor Olson in his book. The individuals and groups we should target should be based on concrete evidence, profiling techniques, red flags, and legal and historical precedents. Similarly, the surveillance of these targets should also be appropriately conducted under the accountability of the Justice Department with the help of a federally issued warrant. This will increase both the scope and likelihood of legality and success of intelligence targeting operations. As outlined by Louise Richardson in her iconic book, What Terrorists Want, part of the motivation behind terrorist involvement with terrorist groups in the first place is for the material benefits that such groups promise and offer. One of such material benefits is the fame, recognition, and media attention granted to terrorists who successfully carry out their plots. One way to address such a problem and to prevent an increase or a sustained influx of terrorists would, therefore, to go to its root and cut out material benefits whenever possible. When discussing the media's attitude towards terrorists, this is definitely an attitude that policy can change. 
Although the U.S. media apparatus is primarily private, public funding for media channels could be allocated to channels who comply with appropriate portrayal of terrorists and revoked or reallocated from channels who do not comply with such guidance. This public pressure would provide a good economic incentive for media companies and conglomerates to alter the way they cover terrorism and terrorist plots. Government agencies and departments, which have their own press system, could also get ahead of the curb and provide more desirable coverage of terrorism and terrorist plots. Cutting off part of the material benefits that lead terrorists to get involved with terrorist organizations, in this case, the attention and fame they garner from such an involvement, would be a productive way to prevent terrorism. Moreover, learning from past mistakes in Iraq and Afghanistan, there should be an increased cooperation and intelligence sharing between the United States and their Five Eyes partners. Pursuing additional intelligence sharing partnerships with America's biggest allies, especially Western European countries, would also be worthwhile. More important, however, would be an increased intelligence sharing and partnership at the internal level, within and between United States government agencies and departments. Even though there are 17 member agencies of the American IC, many of them do not produce unique intelligence in many cases, but rather duplicate existing intelligence without them knowing. One way to remedy this would be to increasingly digitize intelligence findings and reports, and to centralize them in databases which would be accessible to all members of the IC. There have already been attempts to do this at NSA, and these efforts should continue. Again drawing from Richardson's book, as well as other experts on terrorist radicalization, Julie Chernoff-Wong and Mark Sageman, there are plenty of social and economic reasons behind joining terrorist organizations. We have a chance to address social and economic radicalization factors and solve them, once again, through policy specifics. As they explain, high youth unemployment, generational poverty, low social and economic mobility, abrupt demographic changes, periodical wage stagnation, decaying trust of institutions and authorities, and high mental illness and drug usage rates are tied to increased risks for individuals to join terrorist or at least ideologically extremist organizations and to be radicalized, quote-unquote. This also goes for higher crime rates in general, as well, no matter the type. A good welfare and social safety net system, along with robust middle-class protections, good health care benefits, and labor conditions for all, in other words, a robust social democracy as we have in Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and other Commonwealth countries, have a tremendous impact in reducing economic and social factors behind individuals joining extremist organizations, including terrorist groups. This is corroborated by a plethora of studies done on the linkage between high scores for social and economic development indexes and low crime, political polarization, and radicalization. All other developed nations in the West, excluding the United States, are a testimony to this phenomenon. The United States should therefore borrow knowledge and policy from other Western countries in this regard. Similarly, these countries also have strong firearms sales and acquisition regulations, which the U.S. does not have. This is something the U.S. government should further look into, and that U.S. intelligence agencies should support. Simple regulations like requiring background checks on all gun sales, creating a national database for all gun sales, Preventing sales of firearms to people deemed dangerous by law enforcement, closing the gun show loophole, barring gun purchases by those on the federal no-fly list or terrorist watch list, and banning high-capacity magazines have tremendous public backing and have been repeatedly shown to work by social science and criminology studies in other countries as government systems. While terrorism and ideological violence are impossible to completely eradicate for all eternity, these policies would all be viable ways to contain terrorist recruitment and attacks for the decade and decades to come. In today's episode, I covered recommended U.S. intelligence priorities for the upcoming decade. I argued that U.S. intelligence counterterrorism resources and priorities should be shifted from Islamic terrorism towards right-wing terrorism. I also briefly mentioned how more resources should be given to countering left-wing terrorism, which includes ecological terrorism, and to counterintelligence and counterproliferation efforts. I ended by proposing methods that may be used to respond to and prevent these growing and enduring threats, including federal and military hiring reform, a stronger social democratic system, and gun reform. 
This episode may act as a policy brief for the United States government regarding federal intelligence priorities and strategies. Please join me in November for a new episode where I will explore the Iraq War and propose a peaceful and sustainable end to it which will involve both the governments of Canada and the United States. Feel free to debate the ideas put forward in these episodes by submitting a comment, counter video, or by emailing us at realpoliticpodcast1 at gmail.com. Please check out our Patreon if you would like to support us as well. All used sources for this episode will be in the description box below. Thank you and take care.